Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. This is what I want to do. I want to pray for us, and then we'll jump into where we're at today in this series. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I believe that every single one of us that is here is here on purpose, that you have decided that we should be here to hear your word and be in your presence amongst your people. Father, I pray that you would do a work that only you could get the credit for right here and now. God, that, that you would change hearts, all of our hearts. God, that where we have uh, blind spaces, you would give us sight. We have deaf ears, you would give us hearing to hear you, to see you, to know you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we've been in a series uh, for just a little while now, this is I think the 25th week, uh, called Supporting Cast, and what we're looking at is that the Bible is the story about God. He's the hero, he's the main character, and that we can learn a lot by looking at the other members in Scripture, but that the, the Bible is to point us, reveal to us who God is and how we as his creation relate to him. And so what we've done is we've looked at the supporting cast members in Scripture because we can learn a lot from them. So we started at the beginning, we looked at Adam and Eve, uh, we looked at Adam, uh, or excuse me, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, now we've been looking at Joshua. If you don't know who Joshua is, I'm going to give you a quick up, uh, recap to get you up to date. You've probably heard of Moses, even if you've never heard of Joshua. Moses is the one that God calls as a leader when he wants to pull his people out of slavery and oppression in Egypt, set them free, have them be his people, and take them to the promised land. Moses is that guy. And so if you've ever heard the story of the plagues or the Red Sea, or the, uh, that's, uh, Moses well, Moses has an aide. In fact, that aide since his youth has been Moses' aide. That's Joshua. So he's basically the disciple of uh, Moses, this Joshua is. And he's seen amazing things, done amazing things, and, and really been, been shaped and, and molded to be the next leader in the nation. And so what we have is the people rebel against God. They, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. God has a promised land for them, and he raises up Joshua to be the leader that will take them into the promise. You guys with me? Three of you. The rest of you, we're going to get there today by the grace of God. <clears throat> so Joshua is now going to be in charge of this people that has had a tendency to rebel. They're called to walk into this promise. And, and now it's time for them to go take what God has given to them. We see that when Joshua takes over after Moses' death, God um, sees the need to really in instill strength and courage in him. He tells him to be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Keep my word, the book of the law, on your, on your lips and on your mind and keep that the focus and, and follow after me. Listen to what I say, follow after me. Last week what we looked at was the, the, the starting of the taking of the promised land. God had them cross the Jordan River in this miraculous way where the water heaps up in a pile upstream. Every time it blows me away. The water heaped up in a pile upstream. Okay, your guys' water heaps. It's cool. <laughs> Not miraculous to you. You got some crazy water at home. Water heaps, they go across on dry ground. They get over there and they, they come in contact before they go to Jericho, the first city that's this fortified city that they'll have to have battle with. They come into contact with the commander of the army of the Lord. It's a big deal. God confirms the fact. He said that he would send an angel before them and he does so and shows them this angel is here. The commander of the army of the Lord will go before you. And so they, they come in contact with this angel, and then God gives them a plan. Okay, you're going to go to Jericho, this first city, and he tells them how to do it. They're going to march around with the Ark of the Covenant and seven priests blowing trumpets once a day. They'll, they'll march around and go back on the seventh day seven times, blow the trumpet, make a war cry. The walls will fall, and the Bible says that they're, that they're supposed to devote the whole city to God. What that meant was devote the city to destruction. 
that all living things, people and animals, would be killed and that anything that could be burned up would be burned up and that the precious metals would be taken and put into the treasury of the Lord, that it wasn't for the people, it was all unto God. And we ended by seeing that there was one woman that they talk about in Scripture, Rahab the prostitute, who was commended for her faith because she believes that God is who he says he is and does what he says he'll do, and she put her faith in him, and it saved her and her family. As the whole city was destroyed, she was saved by the grace of God. So today where we pick up is they've now destroyed Jericho, and now it's time to take over this promised land. they got the first city. It's this fortified city. It's time to move forward. The next city kind of on the list here is, is Ai, and as they get ready to go after it, what, what happens is, the Bible tells us, not all the people knew, but the Bible lets us know that Israel had been unfaithful with Jericho. They went in, they, de- they destroyed everything, but they didn't. This guy named Achan, what he had done has been unfaithful. He took some of the things that were devoted unto the Lord, and he took them unto himself, and he took them to his tent, and he hid them, and nobody else knew. So everybody thinks everything's good, but they've sinned. So the Bible says Israel has sinned against the Lord. And so <clears throat> Joshua, looking at the next city, thinking, okay, God goes before us as we go, send some spies to check out the next city. They come back and they say, listen, they're not that strong. There's not that many of them. We don't need to send everybody. Send two or 3,000 guys. We can take these guys out. So Joshua hears that, and he does that. He sends 3, 000, uh, about 3,000 men um, to go take on Ai. And what happens is the Bible says they get routed. They're turned, and they have to retreat. They turn, and they run. 36 of them are mowed down. doesn't seem like a big number when you say routed. 36 out of about 3,000. But it is, and here's why. They have the promise of God that he will go before them and take these things on. The fact that they had to turn and run is a big deal. The fact that 36 of them were killed is a really big deal because the Bible says they come back to camp and all of Israel's hearts are melted and they are like water. They're broken. They don't realize that the reason that they didn't have success and the reason those 36 were killed because of the sin of Achan Okay, so Joshua goes before the Lord, and he falls on his face, tears his clothes. The elders do the same, and and cries out to God and says, why did you bring us here to destroy us? What do I say now? His concern is, he says to God, the people will hear about this. They'll get together and come against us, and they'll destroy us. And he ends by saying to God, what then will you do for your own great name? Okay, God, if these people come against us and take us out, your people, what are you going to do to to make your name great again? Because your name is on us, and if we're done, that's a problem. Now listen to God's response. This is so cool. They had just gone out in power, destroyed Jericho. They move on to the next city. They have some defeat. They're laying there. Clothes torn. The Bible even says that they basically put like dirt on themselves and they're laying before the ark, crying out to God. God's first response back, stand up. Why are you on your face? Israel has sinned against me. They have taken the devoted things. That's so awesome. Stand up. Like what is he saying? He's saying, you're you're crying about something that I already told you why this is going to happen. Like stand up. It was a consequence of decisions that were made. Get up and let's deal with what happened here. Stand up. Israel sinned against me. They took the devoted things. That God tells them, find those devoted things that were devoted for destruction, destroy them, and destroy whoever has them. They've sinned against God. In fact, they've even sinned against their own people because their own people have died and lost as they went into this battle because of their sin. In fact, God says, this is how you're going to find out who it is. <clears throat> Bring the whole nation of Israel before you. I'll show you which tribe to have come out. Of that tribe, I'll show you which clan. Of that clan, I'll show you which family. Of that family, I'll show you which man. So Joshua does that. He brings the whole nation of Israel before him. Tribe, clan, family, Achan. Achan, when he's called out, confesses. He says you know, that he sinned, and he says, I saw this beautiful robe, a Babylonian robe. I saw silver and gold. My heart coveted I coveted after it, and I took it, and I buried it in my tent. So they go, and they get the stuff, and they bring it out. And they bring out his whole family, 
all his animals, and all of his possessions. And the nation stones them. They kill them and light everything on fire. They're purging the sin from their camp that has brought destruction. That, that sin brings a brokenness, often on a level that we have a hard time comprehending because we get the freedom and understanding of what we have in Christ, the, the grace that we receive. And sometimes we can forget that the, the wage of sin is death. Okay, these are fun things. People always really like teaching through these things. But what we see really early on here is we see that, that following after God and listening to him, following his commands through this, he has told them, if you do that, it'll go well. If you don't, it'll not go well. And so uh, we see Jericho as this example of them going about it right originally, and AI, kind of the response to them sinning against God. So everybody's in fear, and their hearts have melted, and we, we pick up next. If you're taking notes, right, dominance. That was disobedience. This is dominance. Their hearts, okay, they've dealt with the sin, but their hearts, now they've seen defeat and they're scared about what do we do moving forward. And God says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Gather the army, go after Ai. And I'm not going to get through what they do now in, in uh, conquering all of the promised land because there's lots of chapters there that we'd have to move through. Um, but there are some really cool battles. In fact, God, even right here, uses their loss that they just had as an advantage to take the city. The next city. You should read it. I don't have time to go. It's this cool ambush. Um, it, it, it's awesome. So they take Ai, and then they, uh, what, what happens is Joshua renews the covenant before the people. See, their heart is melted. They already, after one city, Jericho gets taken over, are, are kind of off base and forget that God is the one leading this, and, and he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And, and so he builds an altar, makes an offering. The Bible says, read every single word of the book of the law to the people. Just a reminder, hey guys, remember why we're here? Remember who brought us here? Remember that the victories are his? Now let's move forward with this. So they do, and, and there's lots of amazing stories. Like, like I said, I, I don't have the full time. I, I hope that you would read through Joshua about some people that live close that say they're from far so they can make a treaty uh, about five kings that come against him. And, and the Bible says that when he cries out to God, the sun literally stood still in the sky so that he had more time to fight against his enemy. Okay, you didn't hear what I just said. The sun stopped <laughs> so that he could defeat his enemy. They conquer the southern part of the land. They conquer the northern part of the land. And then as far as their dominance goes, it ends by listing off all the kings that Moses and, and, and Joshua had defeated. But I, like I said, I don't have time to work through all that today because we're going to go all the way through to the end of Joshua today. Next up is the distribution of the land. God's people move into the land. God proves and shows um, his strength in, in giving them victory and victory and victory. And now it's time for the distribution of the land, and, and we won't get into all that, mostly because I just think most of you don't want to hear, and this tribe got from this river to this rock to this piece of dirt. You should read it. I'm not going to preach it today. But I, I do want to say there was still some land to be taken. I'm going to talk about the land east of the Jordan, where there's some tribes that stayed back, and then west of the Jordan, the nation of Israel here that... that who gets those lands? I'm not going to go through all of them, but I, want to th I, I think it's significant that the first tribe, really, before even the tribe, is the first person who gets land is Caleb. If you've been here throughout this series, you know that Joshua and Caleb were the only two of fighting age that came up out of Egypt that get to enter into the promised land. They're two of 12 spies that went in and checked out the land. They came back, and when 10 spies said, we can't do it, we're too small, we look like grasshoppers in our eyes and definitely in theirs, that there were two men led by Caleb to say, we can do it. God is with us. We can do it. And that I think it's significant that as Joshua is getting some of these props of taking the people into the promised land, the first person that gets the inheritance of land and gets their chunk is Caleb. And I want you to hear, it's 45 years later now, I want you to hear what, what the zeal of an 85-year-old lover of God looks like. Joshua 14, starting in verse 6, it kind of just introduces them. And he says to Joshua, you, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God. 
about you and me. Listen, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, <clears throat> sent me to explore the land. And I brought him back a report, listen, according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. That's awesome. He was the minority as far as those that, that believe that God would do what he said he would do and that he can do those things. And at that point, Caleb says, I have this deep conviction about who God is and what his plan is. And I came back and everybody else had these other reports that made their hearts melt. But my conviction, I stayed with and I stuck with, even if it wasn't popular. I, however, followed the Lord, my God, I love it, the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, remember that. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses, said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. Listen. So here I am today, 85 years old, exclamation point. I'm here now. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. I love that. 45 years later, he's 85 years old. And throughout all of it, I, I don't know if you know the history of Israel during these times. There's times where they're doing good with God. There's times where they rebel against him. And he says, I've been wholehearted. I've been consistent with this zeal and this vigor. My strength is still the same. Let's get this. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Man, I'm 85. I still have the strength. I'm still excited for this. And this, just like I would have had to depend on God then, I'll depend on him now and it'll be mine. I love that. I love that. 85. We learn from that. It just keeps the zeal. God said it. I believe it. I've been believing it for 45 years. I'm finally standing here. You just say go. I'm ready to take that thing. Man, that's encouraging. What an example. I mean, let's just be honest. Oftentimes, um, we don't have a whole lot of resilience. We're like, yes, God, we see the promises that you have for us. Oh, I stubbed my toe. I don't know if he's for me or against me or... Will he really come through? 45 years, he sees everybody do it wholeheartedly, and now he's there, and he hasn't lost a step. I may be older, but I'm ready for this thing. I've been waiting for 45 years. I'm glad everybody else is on board now. <laughs> you give me the hill with the, the, the big guys, I got it. I love it. It says, then Joshua blessed Caleb, and, and, and son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So it belongs to him because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. I love how it says Joshua blessed him, like basically like, okay, I'm blessing you to go take that. I don't feel like Caleb was giving him a lot of an option. <laughs> 45 years ago, he told it to me. It's mine. He promised it. I'm ready to take it. Say go. You're blessed. <laughs> that, he, that he gets his peace, and so there's this, Distribution of land, first to Caleb and then to everybody else, all the different tribes. The Bible walks us through what that looks like. And then we're going to spend the rest of our time in the last two chapters of Joshua. Joshua's very old by this time. There's some directives he gives and then a, a decision that he tells them to make. <clears throat> and he's pretty straightforward with some of it. And it makes sense. Uh, he's been leading these people for a long time. He's been amongst these people his whole life. And he's seen them all over the place. He, he's seen them do well believing God and moving forward. He's seen them rebel and turn towards worshiping other things. And, and, and how many know that as people get older and closer to the end of their life, they just have a tendency to say it as it is a little bit more. Because when you're younger, you think like, okay, what are the repercussions of this? How are the people going to respond to what I have to say? Oftentimes when people get uh, towards the end of, uh, of life, it's just like, what are you going to do? 
This is how it is. And so he's, he's pretty direct with some of this stuff. And so what we first see is him summon all the people. The Bible says he's very old in age. He summons all the people. And, and he gives them a, a bit of a directive. And it's a directive. It's, it, it's the same directives he got. And he's passing on. He says this in Joshua 23, starting in verse 6. Be very strong. That's what he was told. Be strong and courageous. He's saying, look, this is what God is here. Keep at it. Be strong. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or the left. He was told that. Keep, keep that word on, on your lips and on your mind and, and stay focused there. And he's passing it on to the next generation. That's awesome. Be careful to obey all that is written. He doesn't just say be careful to, to memorize. He says, be careful to obey all that is written. See, even back then they knew that we have a tendency to cherry pick what we like out of God's word. <laughs> all that is written. You know, we can have a tendency to, to read through scripture and go, oh yeah, that's good, ah, whatever, and keep moving. Well, I don't know, I'm, I'm wrestling with that, and I feel like God would want me to do this even though he says this. So I'll just let that one go. But this one, this kind of affirms what I like and what I do. So that's a great, man, that's a power verse. <clears throat> it says, obey all that is written. What happens is if we start cherry picking the Bible, what we've essentially said is, um, God, <laughs> I'm, I'm in charge of what's your word. I'm God. And I'll decide what's scripture or not. Not the word that you have delivered, that you have given. God, I don't know, you're kind of outdated. That was a long time ago when you said some of these things about how you've designed and created things to function. God, were you not aware of the culture I would live in in 2016? People don't do that archaic stuff now. Now listen, there are some, like understand the context of what you're reading in Scripture. There definitely are some things for certain times and certain people. There's lots of things that are for all of us and that, that we decide like, eh, yes, no, yes, no. All of it. All of it. Without turning aside to the right or to the left, do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods and swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. What is he saying? Follow God. Be strong. Obey him. Do not obey. Do not follow after the idols and the gods that are around you. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The word hold fast there is to cling to. I love that. That it's not just about the, the, the obeying the word. It's about clinging to the one who gave it to you. And we can miss that sometimes even now. And we have the grace and the mercy and, and the cross. And, and, and we can still sometimes get into this religious attitude of do A, B, and C. It's, a, it's about the one who gave us A, B, and C. If our heart is right and our heart is set, then those things start to happen. And we'll get to that more in just a minute. But he says, carefully obey the commands and cling to your God. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand. It, that's cool because it shows that th their victories were miraculous. It says, listen, we, we won battles we shouldn't have won. Like one of you routes a thousand. God's working. He has been working. He's continued to work through all of this because the Lord your God fights for you. Just as he has promised, so be very careful to love the Lord your God. To love the Lord your God. Be strong, cling to him, love him. And then he goes on from there in his directives to the people to give warnings about if you don't. If you don't love, cling to and follow after. That it won't go well for you. In fact, it says the Lord's anger will burn against you if you go after these other gods that are here. And you will perish from the land that he has given you. And then it, it moves to chapter 24. You guys still following with me okay? Or are you already thinking about your um, dinner plans later? <laughs> <clears throat> Verse 
Listen, Joshua 24. With Joshua and the people before the Lord. He's super old here, and it says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. So all the people get here. I'm on the way out soon. Get here. Now, leaders, you step up. We'll present ourselves before God. And then Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. That's a huge statement. You hear me? That's a huge statement. What he's saying is God has called me to speak on his behalf right here. God told me what to say, and I'm going to tell you what that is. That's not a, that's not a, a statement that, that we should toss around. Uh, but, but by making that statement, that there's a level of accountability that just rose about a jillion times. <laughs> Instead of saying, like, hey, I'm kind of thinking this, you, you, he's saying, this is what God says. For us, it's best to just read the word to somebody after we say that. This is what God says in Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> you with me? It's the safest route to go. Um, <clears throat> this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Listen to this. I want you to hear what he says that, that, that God is interested in them hearing here. Because God's reminding them of his goodness. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took, I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates. He says, you guys all associate with Abraham as the one that I elected and, and called to myself, and now you're his people, and I'm your God. Um, before that, there were other gods that that family worshipped, but I plucked him out. I took him from there. I took him, and I led him throughout Canaan. And gave him, who gave him? I, I gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and, I, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried out to the Lord for help, and he put, he talks third person all of a sudden, he put, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought, that's I, I brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. And then he goes through these guys that were against them, and he says that in verse 10, but I would not listen. So he blessed you again and again. I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. Now, here's the thing. They used their bow. They, they swung their swords. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them. And you eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. God's word to them, now that they are settled in this place of abundance and, and the promise that he has given them, is don't forget you didn't do this. I did it. I did it. I did it. It was me. I gave it. I sent it. I made it happen. It was me. I, I went ahead of you. I pushed this forward. In fact, I had people build up cities that you live in now. You didn't even build them. You just live in them. I had people plant uh, plants that now you get to eat from. You didn't even plant them. You just eat from them. And, and, and so God is making it clear, I'm the one that deserves all the glory for you being here. Let's just make sure we get this correct here. I'm the one that gets glory. You get the benefit and the joy of walking in the promises of a great God. And I get the respect of, of the one that pr presented that to you. And now we get to some verses that maybe you've heard before. But it, hopefully now with more context. It says, now. Now what? Now that God has delivered this, Joshua's shifting gears now. Here's what the Lord would say. I'm awesome. I did it. It's all about me. You get to enjoy it. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. 
you know, that's a, that's a directive based on seeing the beauty of God's grace and his mercy and, and his compassion and, and his provision. It's not just a statement that, that lacks that. Oftentimes people can hear us say, like, you just need to do this if you're going to follow God. No, they need to understand the goodness of God. And then it makes sense. So he says, this is what the Lord says. I'm awesome and I'm your God. Now fear the Lord. And fear is, is more than just the fear we understand. It's reverence and, and it's a true devotion. And serve him with all faithfulness. Be, be in service of. Be useful for. Throw away the gods of your ancestors. Worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. Now listen to this. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, you know, in the, in the English Standard Version, it says, if serving the Lord seems evil in your eyes. And the translation for that is undesirable. So when I see something with my eyes that I want, that's desirable. If I don't want it, it's undesirable, and, and it could be evil. So he says, if, if following after God is undesirable to you, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you or evil in your eyes, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. You know what I love about that? He doesn't see, say either choose to serve God or just choose to not serve God and just do whatever because you can just kind of float along. He knows that all of us, everyone, will serve something or someone. And so the option is serve God with a big G, your God that has done all these things, or serve one of these lower G gods, the gods of your ancestors from beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the, the world around you. But you will serve something. You will. You'll either serve God or you'll serve something else, a lower case G God. There is no in-between. There is no, well, I just don't serve anything. I just kind of know you're probably self-serving. And you're your God. You can't save you. We're, we have a problem. Or there's things in this world that we put in that place, those are called idols, that we decide to serve. Sometimes it's a career, sometimes it's, it, that we worship that, we bow to that, that our life is it's the center of who we are and what we do. We serve those things. It ends with a verse, that, part of a, the verse that you've probably heard. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, you've probably seen that on a bumper sticker, a coffee cup, or a painting at a house. And that's cool. You can have all those. I want you to understand the context. What he's saying is this. You're going to serve something, and I can't make you serve anything, but I, let me just remind you of the one that's worthy to be served. And as for me and mine, that's who we serve. And so he's like, I'm on my way out, and I just want to make sure you understand where I stand and give you some good guidance here. Follow him with everything and throw everything else out. And he tells them to make their choice, and he's at the end of his life, so he just says, like, today's, you got to make it today. It's kind of a pressure sell. And the response is, we too will serve the Lord. Listen to this. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us, up, us and our parents up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who live in the land. Listen, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. What an awesome response. That's the response you would hope to get as a leader as you say, listen, I can't make you do anything, but this is the way I'm going and this is the way you should go. And they say, well, we're going to go that way too. You'd think the response would be like, hallelujah. You'd think he would say like, that's great. You're going to do great. I'm so excited. Listen to his response. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. <laughs> Choose who you're going to serve. Serve God or serve these other gods. We're going to serve God. You can't do it. <laughs> you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he's been good to you. And we know that God does forgive rebellion and sin. What he's trying to tell them here is he's, he's explaining the weight of the decision they're making. 
Have you ever made a decision and then told somebody about it and they're like, yeah, me too? And you're like, ah, you don't think, I don't think you heard what I just said. You with me? That you're making a decision because you've, you've contemplated it. You've worked through what that looks like. You've really just done the, the hard part of decision making and really assessed what's going on here. And then, and then somebody, you, you feel like their response is kind of flippant, like, yeah, 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 me too. And so you say, like, no, you don't understand. If we're going to run this marathon, um, I've been training. You haven't. You should probably start running. Right? Like, there's this part of, I don't think you understand what you just signed up for. And, and his response isn't, you know, you shouldn't serve the Lord. What he's saying is, you don't understand how, like, you said yes a little too fast is almost his response. Like, you need to understand that, that the God, like, he is holy and he is jealous and his might and his sovereignty and his power is greater than you're, you're really grasping right now. And your response makes it sound like you can just do it. You can't just do it. It's, it's a real deal. And, and there's accountability for rebellion and sinning against him. That he deals with rebellion and sin. We know that to be true. By the grace of God, we have Christ Jesus who took that on himself as he dealt with our rebellion and sin on the cross. But that God will deal with that. And he's telling those people, like, it's a real thing. You can't just do that flippantly, do whatever you want and think that God doesn't care. There's a part of that that he cares about and he's going to deal with. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. So what their response is, we get it. And we're going to do it. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. <clears throat> yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now listen to this. Now then, now they just kind of pushed back at them and said like, okay, I want to make sure you realize what you're saying right now. Okay, you do? Okay, now. Throw away, remove the foreign gods that are among you. And listen. Listen. Yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel, to yield, to incline, to give up your heart to the Lord. Submit your heart to the Lord. Yield your heart to the Lord. Your heart, your, your inner self, your true self, your deep self. Give yourself your heart unto the Lord. Like you really say you're going to follow him? It's time to remove all of these other things that, that have your, your worship, that have you serving them, that have a part of your heart. Yield your heart to the Lord. You know what I love? He says, get rid of all these external things that are pulling. But then he doesn't say, like, replace them with external. He deals with the heart issue. Because all those other things fall into place when your heart is yielded unto the Lord. You're going to follow him awesome. Yield your heart unto him. We're going to get back to that in a second. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them the decrees and laws. He went back over the law. Like, you said you're going to do it. Let me tell you all the words of the law again. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance. Verse 31, Israel served the Lord, the whole nation served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel, that he led them in worshiping and serving the Lord. In fact, he led his leaders well enough that after he died, they led them in following after God. The bummer about this statement is if they feel the need to tell us that they did it until the elders died, that means where we get back next week is a problem. Because the elders will die, and the people will rebel. So next week, we're going to start looking at Judges. Um, and I'm excited as we continue to, to, to get through the Old Testament. I have a, a couple quick verses from 
that I want to read to you, but I'd like to do that with us standing. Could you, could you stand for a moment with me? The worship team's going to come up. You know, I love that before there's this, this command of these directives to give God everything, there's, there's this clear statement of how great God is and how he is worthy. And in, in Romans, it even says, in view of God's mercy, now offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It's in view of that. Like, look at that. When you're deciding to follow God, look at the greatness of who he is, not whatever it looks like over here. Like, look at the mercy. Like, so when somebody comes and, and hears us reading about this is what it looks like to walk as a Christian, and, and they hear, okay, uh, some speeches or, or letters given to the church about this is how to act and this is how to be, without a proper view of how awesome God is, that seems daunting and it's religious. But then in the Old Testament, the New Testament, they always before that start by saying, remember your God. Remember how loving and gracious and beautiful he is. That, that, that our God has sent Christ Jesus to live a perfect life we can't live, die for our sins, taking all of our sin and giving us all of his righteousness for those that put their faith in him. That he defeated sin, death, and the grave, being raised again, ascended into heaven and sits on the throne and he's coming back for his people. And that when we look at that, everything else just kind of pales in comparison. That when I remember what God has done for me, then 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 anything that it's time for me to lay down makes sense. But here he says, get rid of the idols, yield your hearts. I just want to challenge us as we get ready to close up here to really take an assessment of the condition of our hearts. That it's easy for us in the, in the busyness of what goes on, in, in the constant pull and distraction of the things around us, to have our hearts pulled different ways or our hearts broken or, 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 or muddied or dirtied. That there are things that we, we hold and we say, yeah, God, deal with this, but I'd like to just keep this. Sometimes it's a brokenness that we just identify with. Sometimes it's a, a, a sin that, that's kind of our pet sin that we don't know how we live without. And sometimes we hate it, but we love it. We hate what it does to us, but we have this connection to it. And my heart is, my hope is that today God would help us to have a united heart, not a divided heart. God, that I would wholeheartedly, as Caleb did, follow after you. God, that today if there's parts that feel broken, heal them. If there's parts that feel dirty, purify them. Thank you that all of this happens through what Christ has already done. Help me to walk in it. When Jesus is asked about the most important commandments. He says the most important one, here's the first one, answer Jesus, is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all, all your heart. All your heart. All of it. The whole thing. The entirety of your heart. The, the deep place of who you are. Everything. All of your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. With all your strength. Not with like, oh, this little chunk that I reserve for like my God stuff all your heart. And we get concerned because we categorize everything else in our life. And so we think like, okay, I'll give part of my heart here, part of my heart here. I'll give part of my time here, part of my time there. No, I want, I want to wholeheartedly follow after God and do those things out of a wholehearted devotion to a God that deserves it. Like it, it it's better for me to do those things out of a wholehearted commitment to God than to be divided in my heart. God, I give you some of my heart. I do this out of the way I want to. I do this out of, like, I'm a better husband, dad, father when I'm wholeheartedly after God trying to be everything he's called me to be. I'm a better employee. I'm a better friend. Mm. I will love Lord your God with all your heart. Just consider today, are there parts of my heart, God, that, that you'd like to deal with in your presence right now as we get ready to praise you? God, are the things I've held on to, things that need healing, things that are, uh, I'm divided in. Psalm 86, I love it, verse 11 through 13 says this. I'm like, Billy, why don't you come up? After I, I read this, I'm going to hand you off to Billy. He's going to talk about maybe today how you could be making a, a personal decision on what it looks like 
to walk with God. Psalm 86 says, teach me your way, Lord. It's awesome. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. That's beautiful. My, my salvation, my sanctification, it, the, the things that God does in me, it's relying on his faithfulness. What a peace there is. Why? Because I'm broken. I'm going to mess up. But he is faithful. It's his strength I rely on. It's his work that is finished and complete and is done. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. Give me an undivided heart, God. I have a tendency to divide my heart, divide my loyalties, my worship, my serving. God, give me an undivided heart. One translation says, unite my heart. God, bring it together. That I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. That's awesome. God, I want to praise you with all of my heart, but I need you to fix it first. God, give me an undivided heart, a united heart that I can praise you with all of it. That the intention is that I would give you glory completely and that I would find the joy and the benefit of doing so. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will gl glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. For all of us that are in Christ, that is us. That is us. We were dead in our sins, our trespasses, our transgressions. But we were brought to life by his spirit as he revealed to us who he is, what Christ has done, and gave us faith to respond. Yes, God, I put my hope in the finished work of Christ Jesus who died in my place for my sin and gave me his righteousness that I might stand in right standing with you in a relationship with you, having confidence coming before your throne. I want us to consider that, assess, okay, God, what are the things maybe in my heart today as, as Billy talks to you about what that might look like for you and as we worship him. I love you. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Ross.